I wanted to start by saying that the last time I saw you, we were t you told me that you had this book coming out and we have the same editor, one of the same editors, and you told me that he had said to you after you finished it, wow, are you sure <laughs> you want to reveal all of this to the world? Um, and I was like, okay, wow, I'm really excited to read this book now. Um, and now that I have, I understand what he meant, but I think it's also, uh, I mean, just super brave and blunt and also not sort of like gratuitously salacious, actually, which I think is a thing that people get pushed to do in memoirs. Like I read this and I felt like, and I personally know how hard it is to do this. I felt like every detail from the sort of, I don't know, uh, what could be construed as clickbaiting extreme details, which we've all heard about in, in, in the excerpts that have run, um, to the subtler stuff, it all felt like appropriate to the story. Um, and so the question at the end of that is, how, how did you get to be such a good writer and such a good narrative storyteller? Where does that piece come from, do you think? Uh, I mean, assuming that I am. You are. Thanks. Um, I'm an expert and I'm telling you that you are. Perhaps. <laughs> It's, it would be a few things. One is my mom was an English major, and so I grew up around books. Yeah. And growing up, um, I know my friend Paul is here from Darien. Paul, you here? Hi. Hey, Paul. Hi. I'm wearing the anthrax shirt you made. <laughs> um, and so growing up, I didn't have much of a social life. Certainly didn't date. Uh, played in some punk rock bands, so I had a lot of time to like listen to records, play guitar, watch TV, and read books. Yeah. And my mom had an amazing book collection. And she, like, when I was mm. nine years old, I started reading Charles Bukowski, because mm. she <laughs> loved Charles Bukowski. Wait, that explains a lot. Yeah. That, yeah, And okay. I would, so like, summer vacation, I had nothing to do, because this was pre-cable, and we only got three channels yes. anyway, and like, so like, there were cartoons in the morning, but like, the middle of the day, like, there's nothing to watch on TV. So that forced me into the arms of reading. Mm. And I would go through her books and I would pick the ones with the cool titles. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's like Faulkner, As I Lay Dying. Like when it's you're cool 12 title. years old, yeah. you're like, I want to read As I Lay Dying. And then you read it and you're like, oh, what a misleading title. <laughs> um, and then certain things like Rambo, A Season in Hell. Yes. Like how, when you're like a 13 year old aspiring punk rocker, how do you not read A Season in Hell? Yes. And my grandmother had a subscription to The New Yorker. My mom had a subscription to Atlantic. And I would get so bummed out when I read all the short stories. So it was just like- <laughs> So you had so, that inclination. So it's sort of like the creation of that voice in your head where you're like, okay, I know what works. And also growing up in this world of like endless, narrative content, we also very quickly realize what doesn't work. Yeah. You know, like when you're watching like that terrible Bohemian Rhapsody movie, sorry. But like the dialogue, I was like, rup, rup. I was like, did they hire like a 12 year old kid who's never actually spoken <laughs> to write this dialogue? Like, and you're like, this doesn't work. So it's sort of like first and foremost, write or even make music from the place of being a fan yeah. Um, and then. Okay, I can but, see that. And then the hereditary part, because like, the first memoir, I didn't want to write it. Really? Because I was like, it seemed like the funnest job in the world. Like you hire someone, to like, like Neil Strauss type person. <laughs> you tell them your stories, they write everything down, they make it interesting, and you just sit back and do nothing. Uh huh. And my editor said, you know, you're related to Herman Melville. <laughs> you have to write your own book. And I was like, oh, it's a strong fuck. point. Like, I, mean, I don't want to yeah. write my own stupid book. I want someone else to write it for me. I didn't know that. So you, so the, because it's well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you, you wrote, was it 2016 that Porcelain came out? It was. I remember because I haven't been on a like romantic date in three years, <laughs> and it came out right before I started my sort of like weird secular monasticism. So yeah, it was about three years ago. So is that why you're getting so much writing done? Is that what you're telling me? Is that the secret? It helps, yeah. Uh huh. Because it's just surprising to hear, I'm, it's interesting and surprising to hear that you wouldn't, that you weren't inclined to write the first one because it feels like you went right into writing this one. I mean, you've talked about this. Like, 
how is that what happened? Did you just sort of not stop? Like, how do the two fit together for you? And what perp what role does this one serve in terms of the kind of larger narrative that you began last time around? Okay, well, the first one, because I growing up, I had assumed that memoirs or autobiographies were written by people like at the end of their life. Yes. Which I might be. <laughs> we the all night, might the, be the at the end of our young. lives at any point. Yes. Um, and, or, or like disgraced public figures, or like athletes <laughs> who had like a moment. People of running for idea. president. Do you exactly. have something you want to tell us, or and, no. you want to be two thousand five hundredth yeah, candidate? Yeah, me and Marianne Williamson. Yes. Like, um, okay. So, and then Bob Dylan wrote his chronicles, mm -hmm. and Patti Smith wrote Just Kids, mm -hmm. and I'm not comparing myself to them, but I'm saying like, oh, they mm -hmm. were able to write these very discreet historically contextual memoirs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, my weird history in New York from 89 to 99 mm -hmm. satisfied some of that criteria of like, it was very, it was unique in a way that doesn't exist now. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I'll write that first book and it'll be about me, but it'll be almost more about New York and the rave scene yeah. and relapsing. And it had a sort of Dickensian archetype. Yes which sounds pretentious, but it does. You're um, a writer now. You're allowed to do yeah. things like sound pretentious. And because yeah. it was like this innocent, wide-eyed kid like goes <laughs> to the big city and sort of gets destroyed yeah. by it. And when it was done, I'd really enjoyed writing it. And also, if you never release a memoir, you should still write one. Because as far as like a self-diagnostic tool, it's great. Like when you have to like take your past <laughs> and not just passively remember it or discuss it in therapy, but flesh it out. Yeah with like all these sort of like sensory somatic details, you revisit your past in a way that you otherwise never would. And so it can be, so I advise everyone write a memoir, even if you're a toll booth attendant, go write a memoir. Yeah, and you'll you learn don't have about to show yourself. it to anyone. That's, yeah. yeah. So, okay, that's, so what did you learn? I mean, I was actually curious about that for this one. I mean, you get in to, I love the structure of this book. There's a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and debauchery and all the things that people are reading about getting covered, something about your flaccid penis and Donald Trump has come up a time or two. Um, that, and, and these anecdotes are amazing and just as sort of dramatic and I, I don't know, kind of, I, again, I respect this so much, sort of appropriately lighthearted in the way, even though they're very dark in the way that you document them. But there's also all this really intense material from your childhood. Um, did you, did, uh, this is going to sound like a sort of weird question, but mm. how much of what's in here from, from those kind of really early memories, I mean, you're three, you're five, you're, did you know before you sat down to write these, like in the most conscious way, were they part of the story that you're, you had been telling yourself about your own life before you wrote this book? A little bit. I mean, so originally this was supposed to be two separate books. Oh, okay. There's like the childhood memoir ah. and then the adult memoir. Okay. The adult memoir, which is have a lot of fame, become a terribly narcissistic, entitled public figure, lose your fame, be driven insane by it, bottom out as an alcoholic and a drug addict, try to fix childhood issues with fame, debauchery, et cetera. Like, that story's been told a bunch of times. Yes. And so, but when I started writing that, it became very tautological. Mm -hmm. um, just this tautology of like spiraling downwards. And I was like, there have been quite a lot of celebrity memoirs written with that structure. Mm -hmm. And then when I wrote the childhood memoir, it was interesting, mm -hmm. but I was like, oh, what if we sort of fold the two together? Mm -hmm. Where you provide, again, almost, you know, this contextualize the terrible stuff that happened in adulthood mm -hmm. with terrible stuff that happened in childhood. Mm -hmm. And part of it was the idea of, mm -hmm. in a weird way, trying to be of service. Because mm -hmm. what I learned, I started going to AA a long time. I guess that sort of like outs me. And like, there's the, so it's supposed to be the anonymous part, which clearly. You don't have to choose to be anonymous about. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you do. Um, <laughs> so in AA, one of the things that can be really powerful is when people share honestly, mm -hmm. especially about stuff that most of us are ashamed of. Yeah. You know, like when someone takes that thing that like you've been holding on to and hiding your entire life and they share it mm -hmm. honestly, it's really emancipating. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of wanted to do that mm -hmm. with this is mm -hmm. like take the things that 
in my past I would have been really uncomfortable with and just share them, hopefully maybe reaching people who are uncomfortable with their own trauma and shame. Was there, I'm sure there are a couple of examples of this, but is there any particular such moment or story that we are reading in here that though you had made that sort of promise to yourself that you just described or this realization that this would be useful or of service, you drew back for a minute? Like, were there ever moments in here where it was like, okay, this is too far, this I don't want out there, but actually, wait a minute, yes, I do. Like, what are, tell us the worst ones, like the abs, no, you, you know the, what I'm saying. Like, I what made you question The, the worst that? ones are in there, the like, I mean, some of the really embarrassing stuff mm -hmm. is the bad behavior mm. that while I was engaged in that was very unself-aware. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like I, and, and so if someone were to like pick it up and read one chapter, they would understandably think that I'm loathsome. And I would sort of want to mm -hmm. pull them aside and say like, oh no, like, like things have changed, I yeah. hope. Like I might be, still be loathsome. Get to the next chapter. But I'm not as, hopefully That's not as bad as that. But I mean. I see. I gave myself that challenge of like, just be honest because what's in a way, like what's the worst that can happen? And I, and I had this mm -hmm. very sort of new agey quasi epiphany a few years ago mm -hmm. is I was hiking Griffith Park mm -hmm. um, and it was like one of those beautiful February days where it's like 72 degrees and the sky is blue and the sun was shining on me and it smelled like sage and whatever else Frozen Griffith, Griffith Park yeah. smells like. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, I was like, okay, if my last record had sold 10 million copies, how would this experience be different mm -hmm. or improved? Or if anything else was going on in my life, how would, like, and I'm gonna sound like such a hippie, so I sort of apologize, but like, the sun wouldn't be different. Right. The air on my skin wouldn't be different. Yeah. And so I was like, basically there's this liberation when you realize like, no one can hurt you. Mm. No one can get, like, there's, there's nothing that anyone could do. Like, if, if, if I'm maligned for this, <laughs> and I get terrible, terrible reviews, which I don't read anyway, it doesn't change. What difference does, the sun doesn't care. Sun doesn't change, yeah. the wind doesn't change, the, yeah. the bees in my backyard, they don't care. Mm -hmm. And there's something so liberating about that. Mm -hmm. and, and then also, looking at the times in my life where I've desperately tried to control the way in which people respond to me mm -hmm. or react to me, and it didn't work out. Doesn't and then work. we look at like, I mean, we're in ground zero for aging public figures trying to control the way the world <laughs> sees them. And yeah. it leads to a litany of egregious and terrible mistakes. Yeah. You know, like the plastic surgery, the pretending you're younger than you are, the hiring a producer to make a collaboration between you and some dysfunctional new pop star, or mm -hmm. like firing your agent because they didn't get you on Real Housewives of Methadone Alley or whatever, <laughs> you know, like. So it's That's like, a good one though, but yeah. Yeah. The and f Okay, so many thoughts about that. Um, <laughs> wow, what, but what, so one of the things that I was thinking that feeds into what you were just saying about the particular type of fame you've experienced, which is certainly a theme of this in exactly the way you just described, although that's like a much, that gives a lot of context to so much of what I read here. But there's this type of fame that comes after you thought you were gonna be famous and you've already given up on the idea. It's a unique, like sort of, I don't know, um, sub genre of fame. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wonder if that, if you, if you have specific thoughts on that part of the way you became famous and how it shaped your relationship to it, because it seems like, I mean, you, obviously we were in New York around the same time. I, the, the sort of the 9-11 chapter is really intense. I remember asking you about 9-11 for the book that I wrote as well. And just thinking about how your story that you document here maps on to what was happening in New York during that time from the perspective that I lived through. And it's like, you, as you write here, had already sort of been like, well, play is gonna be my, my last out. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll just, that's how you sort of start this book, is thinking about that as the last tour you'll ever do and the last chance to be on stages and stuff. And then of course the opposite happens, it becomes the beginning of something. I mean, do you think that made you go harder? The, the having spent time essentially fa failing to capture the thing that you thought would make you happy, did it make it extra intense when it finally came? 
Probably. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have nothing to compare it to, I guess. But well, because in the early '90s, there was like a little blip of fame in yeah. the early '90s in the rave scene, and then the mid '90s as well. Like 1995 was this year where I <clears throat> put out the album "Everything Is Wrong." Yeah. I did Lollapalooza. Went on tour with the Chili Peppers and the Flaming Lips. Yeah. Did music for a Michael Mann movie. Like it was great. And then everything went terribly wrong. And I like started drinking again, started having terrible panic attacks. My mom got cancer, my relationship ended, like everything I started, I made a punk rock record that only like two people in the world <laughs> liked. And so by the time play happened, I thought I was just done. Yeah. Like I was like, I'm gonna move back to Connecticut. I'm gonna get like a futon in a like a little condo <laughs> that I rent from my cousin's friend that's by <laughs> I-95 in South Norwalk. And the saddest of all living situations one could imagine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess it was the surprise, like when play started to become better, like as the yeah. fame escalated, it sort of metastasized. Yeah. Where it wasn't like gradual, it was like selling 4,000 copies a week, selling 40,000 copies a week, selling 100,000 copies a week, selling 200,000 copies a week. And it was just like so surprising. Yeah. In fact, I still remember my friend Paul, we were driving on I-95 and I had a cassette of play, and we were driving through Stamford, and we were listening to it, and Paul said, oh, you know, I think people might actually like this record. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought that was ridiculous. I was like, you're, no, that's wrong. No one's gonna like, like, pah. Impossible. Yeah. Right, that was a, I, I um, mean, that seems like a pretty, so by comparison to what your expectations were, that sounded like a very optimistic attitude that Paul was uh, displaying. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember we were in the car with our friend Michael Meacham driving through Stamford. <laughs> so funny. Listening to the cassette, and I thought he was delusional. Yeah, never um, going to happen. But then the thing that's odd, and I'm sure there's literary and historical precedent for, for this, maybe this is like the subtext of our entire culture, is like when you're confronted with circumstances that you think you're prepared for. Yes. Because I had sort of self-identified as a reasonably self-aware person. Yeah. You know, I was like, like, I've, you know, I was a philosophy major and, that covers you know, like, it. I'm yeah. not egregiously stupid. So I was <laughs> like, so when fame happened, I sort of thought like, oh, I can handle this. Yeah. And it's really fascinating when you realize like, oh, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Like I, other people probably could have and would have done a much better job. But like it, like could they though? I mean, some people do. I don't know. I I think that maybe that's true. But I think one of the things that I like about the way you write about your own processing of becoming famous in of this level of fame that we're talking about here is the fact that y it's it's like you keep there are just several moments in the book where you're like, yes, I'd and they're very funny too often where it's like yes i'd i'd heard about um i'd heard about other people who couldn't process fame but i wasn't going to be one of those well, i mean of course i will be the exception to this rule of the fact that fame destroys you you know um so there's one little quote that i want to it's, it's, <gasps> it's just a this I'm is not, the reading mm, sorry that we were all waiting for um nah, nah, nah. it's sorry i'm looking for it I, don't apologize to me i'm yeah. very excited where is it? Come on, stupid book. <laughs> Fuck. Alexa. No, 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 yeah. It's not there. It's okay, it's before the, no. No, it's not that. I, we're almost there. Okay, here we go. So it sort of sums that up. Great. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, somehow a door had opened into this glowing golden world, and Natalie Portman and Gwyneth Paltrow and Madonna and David Letterman and Elton John were holding it open, smiling and telling me that they loved me. If 19-year-old me, the punk rock philosophy major, could have seen what was going on, he would have been disgusted by my obsequious running dog pursuit of fame. Really, he would have asked, you're buying into this celebrity bullshit? Don't you know it's all a facile celebration of commerce and mediocrity? And I would have meekly said, but look, there's Natalie Portman and she's being nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, thank you. You are loved. See, it's all worked does. out. No, I think, well, so this is one of the things that I, I really love this about your book. It's, there's a way in which it's like classy or something. It's standard to when you write your celebrity memoir about how empty fame is to 
sort of act like none of it was fun. Like, oh, well now, you know, it wasn't, yes, Natalie Portman and Elton John are holding, it's heaven and the most famous well, beautiful people in the world are welcoming in and I'm like, no, like, I'm good because I'm balanced, and, you know, like no. Your, your book, yeah. a lot of the people, which I love, yeah, a lot of the people that you write about are very savvy indie rockers <laughs> who you could hold a gun to their head <laughs> and say, tell me you love fame. And they'd be like, never. <laughs> And I know That's I had true. an experience with one of them who shall not be named. Oh, who is tell like us the who. Cool, the, the, just think of like the coolest of the coolest of the cool, venerated in indie trouble. rockers. Okay. I'm and thinking of some people. If you were to ask them about fame, they would like they would never buy into it. <laughs> um, a friend of mine was backstage once where they were screaming at their tour manager about the diminished margins on their merchandise sales. Etc. And like it's it's a ruse. They all want fame. They all want like to get keep getting invited to the parties and sure. like it's it's just. Well, I think I mean this always as someone who interviews bands for a living. Um, and our, our friend Tracy is here somewhere, and she will appreciate this because we've talked about it before. It's like hey, when you sit down to interview a, a young band, there's often a thing you'll often encounter is this resistance it's like i don't want to talk about my story i'm just here to talk about the music and Boring. you're like nobody cares yeah. <laughs> we've yeah. not heard your music we nobody knows who you are your story is you're everything like, oh, wait Be so you're a white guy in a band right and well, you have and songs also, that you've put on a record it's disingenuous because if you really want to just make art in a vacuum that's available like mm -hmm. people get on stage because they want to be seen on and maybe there's complicated feelings around that but it's still true at the end of the day you get on the stage and i love how so i wanted to ask you about that it's just they're one of their this book is heavy there's a lot of sadness in it it's in moments um you know difficult to read in the best sense like emotional and hard and and yet or and additionally i also just let like getting on a helicopter with a bunch of mobsters to go to staten island you know mm. these great new york stories that it really feels like a certain there's a lot of description of the city in certain moments it works like a triptych of a new york that's not there anymore um how conscious were you as you were kind of assembling this of leaning in, of not being afraid to say, yes, this is a story about my own self-destruction. I mean, it begins with a suicide attempt. It's really, we're very glad you're here, by the mm -hmm. way. Um, it's, but also that I'm gonna not, but I'm gonna not hide from the fact that some of these events were pretty awesome, even if I wasn't in a good place. Like, how much did you have to think about that, or was it conscious at all? Hmm. I mean, I guess it's also tying it to sobriety a little bit. Okay. Like yeah. a lot of times when people get sober, they just focus on the negative parts of drinking or doing drugs. Yes. And it's almost, it, I think it should mm -hmm. be a little more like a New Orleans funeral. We're like, you're putting something to rest. Was that also, the alternate title? Because that'd be kind of awesome. Because it's, yes. like, it's like, yeah, like when it was good, it was great. Yeah. I wouldn't go back to it for anything. I hope I never have to. But yeah. like to live through it. And like, and I was talking about this. I was going to have some really good name dropping, but I'll do it. Refrain. Come no, on. You already no, hid no. the indie rockers that we both know. From um, I was talking about this with people. an old friend who's in recovery who happens to be Iron Man. Um, <laughs> sorry. And... <laughs> yes! <laughs> and okay. we were talking about this, about how, like, it, in some ways, it's, you get the best of both worlds. You get to, like, celebrate mm -hmm. like no one has ever celebrated, and you get to truly bottom out. <laughs> like, truly. <laughs> like, you're, to, like, you're, like, you get to self-destroy and deal with, like, crippling depression and anxiety and self-loathing, and it's all... Mm -hmm perfect because when you emerge you have that experience and hopefully you have like some humility and wisdom yeah. that you would never otherwise have yeah. you know and that's what I'm what I prize the most it's just sort of like perspective that is the product of everything yeah. you've gone through it does feel when you read this like the person writing it has a lot of love for the person who was living it um hmm which is nice. I think maybe it's just the distance that you have. I mean, the sobriety distance and, um, you know, you're not trying to write this having been sober for two years or so. I don't know. Like, for, it, it feels like there's perspective there. And, and as a result, joy, which I think is really 
to, I'm sort of belaboring the point, but that's <laughs> unusual in this type of book. And I was really grateful for it when I hit those moments. I was like, this is making me laugh a lot, you know, <laughs> this, the, these scenes. Um, speaking of name dropping, I'm interested in how, I've, I've not written a memoir, I've read a lot of them, and it, I'm curious about how you, you've now done this twice. How do you decide who to name and who not to name? Uh, I mean, part of it is... Do you call everyone? Or are you just like, hey, excuse me, can I tell that story about... No. No, because... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should have. <laughs> the, only person, the only person I contacted was Andy Dick. Uh-huh. Because he's in the book in such a disgusting way that I had to sort of clear it twice. Like once... Yeah, he doesn't... I was playing a concert in Glen Ellen, and I came backstage, and he was trying to poop on my end of tour cake. And then he like filled a champagne bottle with pee and handed it to me. And then also he, at the end of some crazy night, he was like having sex with someone on my bed while a bunch of people stood around and cheered. So like I just, I was like, Andy, is this okay? He was disappointed that I didn't include more. Oh. Well, what else do you have? For him, I don't, I mean, I think those were the worst ones. Those are the worst ones. You're like, I gave the best stuff, you, the best worst yeah, I mean, stuff pooping, you did. Pooping yeah. on an end of tour cake. But keeping in mind, table like this, <laughs> cake, him with his pants around his ankles, squatting over the cake while a bunch of people... It's a and, great and scene. ...were going, poop, 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 poop. And it's and, Charlize Theron and who tell And John you? Taylor from Duran Duran. Yeah. Like, wouldn't, they they had been in there and they scene. left and they're like, oh God, no. Well, like, and my just, favorite part of terrible. that is where they warn you not to go into your own dressing room. You're like, hey, guys, what are you guys doing out here? And they're like, yeah. don't go in there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but including people, I mean, part of it is also, honestly, like if I was, a, a friend of mine wrote a memoir, and I really can't name names, he had had like, like this crazy glamorous past, and when he wrote his memoir, he wasn't going to write about any of the degeneracy. Oh, yeah. And I was like, well, that's all that people care about. Like, have you looked at the culture in which we live? Like, we're not <laughs> looking for your insights. We want, like, who did you have sex with on a private plane? Yeah. Um, and he didn't include it. As a result, no one cared about the book. Yeah. Um, so there's Oops. a little bit of, like, you know what? I think it's, um, I read an interview with Neil Young a long time ago, and he was making a Greatest Hits album. Mm -hmm. And he said his only criteria for choosing Greatest Hits was what he would want if he was mm -hmm. buying a Greatest Hits album, mm -hmm. you know? And so I sort of thought, like, if I was buying this book, yes, I would want some celebrity name dropping. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't have to invent it, but, like, <laughs> to leave it out would be, like, why? Like, th like, that's what people want. And it's also, like, indicative of the extent to which, because if you notice, like, by the end of the book, there's not a lot of celebrity name yes. dropping because I no one wanted to hang out with me, you know? <laughs> um, but I also have, was very clear in this book and the other book <laughs> is like no oh. one gets thrown under the bus yes. except for me. Yes. Everybody is dealt with as respectfully as possible except for me. You know, like I didn't want to use this as like, like Morrissey's memoir is fascinating. Yes. But he just used it as a way of like criticizing whoever ran rough trade in the UK, <laughs> you know? So You can use it as a tool of vengeance against to sort that of... That seems so one-sided. I mean... Yeah, it's not, it's not the way that I would go, but it is, I mean, there's sort of nobody better at that kind of sniping than Morrissey, so I guess if you're, if someone's going to do it, it might as well be him, but yeah, yeah I hear what you're saying, and I think... The Werner Herzog book, if, if oh, you're going to, have you ever read Werner Herzog's memoir? Has anyone here not. ever read Werner Herzog's memoir, Audience. Paul? It is phenomenal, because all it is, it's page after page of who he had sex with, <laughs> and how much he hates Werner Herzog. That's the entire book. It's like, I walked by a store, and I saw this voluptuous Filipino, and I had to have her, so I had her. By the way, Werner Herzog is a toad, and I want to fucking kill him. That's the entire book, page after page after page, and you're like... Quick read, then. God bless yeah. you, like, Klaus Kinski, for just being this feral raccoon. That's pretty... Okay, is that... Are you giving us a teaser of your next project? Yeah. Is it going to be... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay, so something you said earlier that I wanted to come back to is just, and it's actually connected, the level of perspective you are now revealing about, I guess it's you and Neil Young, um, who have the ability to view your own career and what's interesting about you 
to people who are interested in your work is really tricky. I, that's really hard. And it one thing you, when I the thing I wanted to come back to is what you said earlier about the way you structured this. So nerding out on writing for a minute. Sorry, like you brought a writer here. This is what happens. Um, did you really write the childhood book and the sort of fame book separately mm -hmm. and then integrate them? Because it feels like this is maybe whatever. It feels like a mixed record. Like it feels almost when you said that I was like, oh, and then you just cut them up and almost sort of. I mean, it feels a little like you produced. If each of these is, is a track. Oh, well, they were, I mean, then they were all rewritten to, to work with each, each other. other. It, wasn't, it wasn't like. You didn't just kind of cut and paste and then like, no, yeah. No, I, I mean, mean that there, would have been but incredible. But there was the fame book and the childhood book. And, and then when I sort of started to work them together, I didn't want to make it too obvious. Yeah, it doesn't feel. But at the same time, like I wanted them, it shouldn't be too jarring. But it's fast. Like I think it. I guess what I'm saying is that it feels like in this perspective that you're revealing, <laughs> Neil Young inspired you to have about what's interesting about yourself and like don't skip on the skimp on the celebrity gossip is like rule number one uh, for making a greatest hits record. It does feel like there was a sort of um, omniscient Moby who structured this as well because it's the the chap it just has a lot of movement and just when something's too sad you bring us to something that's like at least more uh, andy dick like or something a jar off off topic of childhood and into something more i don't know I, glamorous isn't the right word but i wonder if it's a product of one reading a lot of other people reading yeah. other books yeah one, learning from other people's mistakes. Yeah. Um, like in terms of memoirs, there are, as we all know, like there are a lot of not great memoirs. Yes. And I sort of would go through them and be like, oh, here's what not to do. Like, yeah. don't be disingenuous and don't write about stuff that no one cares about. Like, no <laughs> one cares about compressors. No one cares about, like, oh, I was thinking of, Correct. we were working on track three, oh and I really Correct. thought that, like, we should tighten the head on the snare drum. Like, no. You're giving me, like, interview it. PTSD yeah. right now. Like, yeah, I like, feel, and like, we thought stop talking if we about put that. the bass through <laughs> the DBX compressor, <laughs> it would just make it punchier. And at that point, you're like, wow, you're terrible. Terrible. Like, it's so like boring. Like, and I like also sadism. hate your songs now, even yeah. though I haven't heard them because you made me listen to talk about so how like you made them. Learning from those mistakes, but also I think it was years and years of DJing in shitty bars. This is what I'm saying. Like, You're so well trained for this to entertain people. You like know? The beat, it was this nightclub in Portchester, New York, where I DJed <laughs> like three or four nights a week for six hours a night. And like you had to keep people dancing. Yeah. And like so you became hyper aware of how people were responding. Yeah. And if you played something, you could in less than one second feel like, oh, like the attention has waned mm -hmm. and the people are no longer interested. And I think, I mean, I feel like something, it affected my neurochemistry in mm -hmm. some way, spending years just like hyper fixated uh -huh. on that dialectic. You know, like you're Being putting something out and it. people are in, actual real-time responding mm -hmm. so like and that's i don't know if i did it well but if you're Good. asking someone to read a 300 some odd page book like you don't want to waste their time and also what i learned in sequencing albums yeah is the better the sequencing the more likely people are to get to the end yeah you know like if you wake people up with every chapter like so the beginning of every chapter the beginning of every song like i mean how many records where like there's 12 songs and they all sound very similar. So after three or four, you're, you're like, like I don't out. need to hear the rest of this. Yeah. You know? No, it has a real, that's, yeah, that makes sense. It feels like it has its own engine and that engine is perfectly calibrated to like at least this reader's hmm. attention. Well, um, you're editing my next book, just in case you're wondering. Okay. <laughs> New plan. Um, so I wanted to ask you also a bit about, there's a lot of really, there's a lot of famous people in the book, as we discussed, that was part of the plan. But there's also, well, and a lot of those encounters with like people who are your actual friends, like David Bowie, um, are really revealing and sort of generous of you to share. I think for the rest of us who didn't get to go to David Bowie's apartment for dinner on a regular basis, um, I mean, maybe many people in this audience did, but I, I certainly didn't. And I think, I, the question really buried somewhere in this observation is how 
you have had the chance to meet a lot of your heroes and mm -hmm. then also a lot of people you might have admired who probably didn't turn out to be all that awesome, which is one of the famous sort of euphemisms about fame. It's like, don't meet your idols because they might disappoint yeah. you. How, how has that been? I mean, on balance, would you recommend it? Would you recommend meeting the people that, you know, made you feel less alone as a child? Has that worked out on balance well for you? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Like David Lynch. Yeah. Becoming friends with David Lynch. Uh, he's just wonderful. Yeah. Like, he's just like a delightful, happy man. Um, sometimes, no. Like, I've met some <laughs> musicians where I really liked their work, and they ended up being not great. Yeah. You know, under, like, just very self-involved. And as, does that change the work for you? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Like, there's some bands I used to really like, and, like, you meet the musicians, and I've, I'm, I know I was guilty of this as well, of being sort of like arrogant, self-involved, but like when you grow up and you go out into the world and you meet a self-involved musician, yeah, you like, kind of want to pull them aside and say, look, dude, <laughs> you wrote a couple of songs. Get over like, yourself. You didn't start a needle exchange program. <laughs> you're, not, you're not inventing electric cars. Right. You know, like, come on. You wrote a couple of songs that sound like songs that someone else wrote. Like, that's not cause <laughs> for narcissism and entitlement, you know, like. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I did want to read one of my. Yeah. Cause, so the David Bowie stuff. So um, mm -hmm. Gavin Edwards, you know Gavin, of right? Course, so Gavin yeah. was my, the editor for the book. Oh, okay. I didn't and know he that, kind actually. of pushed, because he, he loves David Bowie. Thanks, Gavin. So he pushed, yes. he actually wants me to write a book about David Bowie. But Sold. here's, I'm just going to read one. This is my favorite. Because, like, I grew up obsessed with David Bowie. The first job I ever had was a caddy at Weeburn Country Club in Darien, and I worked just long enough to buy David Bowie records. And I became friends with him. And are there any David Bowie fans? And, you know, okay. <laughs> so, okay, this is... Okay, the week before, David had been at my apartment to rehearse for a charity event we had agreed to do together. He got off the elevator on the fifth floor by my door, held out a coffee for me, and said, Delivery boy... He sat down on my couch and placed the deli coffees on the coffee table. I took my guitar out of its case. I have an idea, I said, aware that David Bowie, a demigod, was sitting in my living room and I was talking to him as if we were equals. What if for the event we played heroes on acoustic guitar, I asked. He smiled kindly and said, sure, let's give it a try. I'd practiced playing the chords to heroes the night before, rehearsing by myself on the off chance that he would agree. I quietly strummed the opening D major chord, David took a sip of his coffee and started singing. I was somehow able to focus on playing, even though I was having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> David Bowie was in my living room, sitting on my couch, singing the most beautiful song ever written. During the second verse, his voice rose dramatically. I got a little choked up, sorry. And I had to remind my little alcoholic heart to keep beating. After our 30-minute rehearsal was over, we finished our coffees. David mentioned that he was having dinner at his apartment the following week with Lou Reed and Laurie Anderson. He smiled and said he'd love for me to join them. Iman and I can even make something vegan, he added. <laughs> so, I mean... Just to put... Sitting on my couch with David Bowie playing Heroes on acoustic guitar on a Saturday morning after he brought me coffee. <laughs> How do you even process That's that? That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, that was exactly what I was thinking about. And yeah. I think, I don't know how you, how do you process that? I, I mean, it's, it's funny because like the, the people who I've revered, who I've met, who I've worked with, yeah. it's all that scene in Wayne's world when Wayne meets Alice Cooper. <laughs> Minus the falling down on the floor, where he's like Most just like of the time, yeah. pretending to be like. So it's all. Oh my God. It's a ruse. Like yeah. every second that because I went on tour with David Bowie, and this is a funny story. He opened up for me. <laughs> to be clear, the reason was we were playing festivals, and he wanted to leave and not sit in traffic. <laughs> so he was like, I'll Pro go on move. before you. He's like, so I can leave and not have to sit in festival traffic. So you did him the favor of letting him, him open, open up for me. Okay. Yeah. Got it. But that like, so we saw each other every day backstage. We did TV shows together. We spent all this time together. The entire time I was like, oh yes, we're friends. It's normal. <laughs> but in my heart of hearts, I'm Wayne and Garth on the floor <laughs> in front of Alice Cooper. Just like, we're not worthy. Like, we're not worthy. and I never once mentioned his music to him. Mm. Like I, cause 
I was just like, how, how do you? Mm -hmm. Except for one song, it's in the, he played me this song he was working on called Slip Away, mm -hmm. and it's the most beautiful song he's ever written. It's on Heathen, and it, I mean, that's saying a lot because he wrote a lot of beautiful songs. Sure it's also one of the only truly autobiographical, honest songs he mm -hmm. wrote. If you leave here and go listen to it, it's a beautiful song, and I told him how much I loved that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really, I mean, as I said, those, those moments of sort of encounters with fame, which isn't really about fame, it's about like human beings whose work so many of us admire, they're mm -hmm. real sort of mm. gems in this because it's, as a David Bowie fan, like it, it, it means something to me to get to imagine those moments that you're describing. Like it's just really nice, they're lovely. Oh, th um, thanks Gavin for encouraging. I'm, I'm but, calling Gavin right after this to but tell him. One other call. aspect of it is, because when I was growing up, and I don't know if you felt this way or if anyone else here felt this way, I felt that there was an adult class yeah. of leadership and genius and competence and capability, and they ran everything and that they were doing a great job mm -hmm. and that if I ever met them, I would be so impressed with their erudition and their competence. Oops. That does not exist. <laughs> Spoiler I've alert. Every, yeah. I mean, there's some really smart, competent people. Yeah. But like, I've met, like, for example, I met the Dalai Lama. He's okay. <laughs> like, he's fine. He's a human. Like, he's perfect, oh like, God. smart, insightful, but like, he's a human. He's a human. And, and you meet yeah. these, and you're like, oh, no one ever escapes or transcends the human condition. No one escapes ego, no one escapes going to the bathroom, <laughs> no one escapes occasional bouts of pettiness, and mm -hmm. like you meet these people and like you, at first I was so disappointed, but then you realize like the human condition affects everyone. And there's something, I think there's something at the end quite soothing about that, because you're like, oh, well, oh, no Un one's in charge, oh my God, but wait, okay, we really are all in this together in a certain Un sense. Until you start realizing like, oh, they're in the White House. Well, that's and a separate issue. You know, like, so actually that's, those people, I wouldn't, I actually think there's like a lot of, obviously, lack of humanity in the White House. So it's not those things that make someone yeah human in the way that you're describing, or it's like, that's a different thing. But I did actually want to ask about that, and then we'll open it up to some questions. But it, it didn't, I did notice, just thinking about the trajectory of these, and I understand that not everything is tied to politics, but you've written these two memoirs back to back, and 2016, when the last one came out, here we are in whatever horrible year we are getting through this situation. Um, how much of this, I mean, is there a part of this that has just been a therapeutic process, a kind of practice, something to put your attention on that feels positive in, uh, in a space of a lot of, in, in contrast to what feels like a lot of negativity out there? Do you think that's part of why you are going here right now, or is it not related? There's, so my, my very, and I'm gonna try and truncate it. I don't know if you guys do this where you're like, you truncate things in your head, because you know otherwise, just, like it's just blah. <laughs> Um, attempts, so basically, attempts. the book is about <sighs> trying, as I said, like trying to fix not just childhood trauma, mm -hmm. but like thinking that like, oh, when you get to a certain point, the human condition has been fixed mm -hmm. or you are <laughs> exempt from it. Like thinking like the right amount of fame, wealth, degeneracy, attention, validation, etc. Like when you have, like think of it like an existential portfolio. And when you have the right one, everything will be fixed. Mm -hmm. And I tried so hard, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. And then you start looking around, you're like, it doesn't work for anyone. Mm -hmm. But yet everyone, but we keep not just buying into it, like the, like the human misery that's created by pursuing unachievable goals that when you get them, don't make you happy. Mm -hmm. You know, like unachievable ideals of beauty, of fame, of intelligence, of wit, of creativity, but the people who have it, Robin Williams, Kurt Cobain, mm -hmm. Anthony Bourdain, et cetera, et cetera, Ernest Hemingway, on and on and on. Like, they got to where we all wanted to go, and they're miserable and killed themselves. Yeah. But yet, everyone is still killing themselves, trying to get to where they were when they killed themselves. That won't be me. It won't yeah. feel like that for me. Yeah. And, and so the human cost is horrifying. But then it's what we do in the process. Yeah. You know, I just read an article to the, the UN released a report yeah. that one million species are going extinct yeah, today. because we are 
pursuing these unrealistic goals. We're like, oh, well, when I have enough plastic and stuff and cars and this, or like, I'm gonna go sit in traffic five days a week for four hours, like serving a boss who's desperately trying to Did get you? that thing. And it's like, we're destroying ourselves, we're destroying the planet. Yeah. So kind of in a way, that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Like one little person's journey trying to fix the human condition <laughs> and eventually throwing up his hands and saying like, oh, guess what? You can't. So the best you can do is like live peacefully, humbly with the awareness. We don't know if our lives have meaning. We don't know if our lives have significance. We all die. We all get sick. We all age. Don't fill things up with plastic. Don't be cruel, like Elvis said. Um, <laughs> so that's, yeah, so that, that in terms of- But that of, is a kind of, I mean, that is a, that's a plan. However, you know, like yeah. that is one person's plan that if it were many people's plans would actually make a difference in all of the areas that you describe. And it really is the only thing that you can do. You yeah. can't make me behave differently and I can't make you behave differently. Yeah. That's you say it. like, this is my experience. Yeah. I mean, in a way, and please don't take this out of context because I think Trump is the worst president we've ever had. In some ways, he's the perfect president for who this we way. are as a species. Mm -hmm because he got everything yeah you know like he's the president of the fucking united states <laughs> and like his name is in big gold things and he's miserable he, right yeah. now he's sitting on a gold toilet tweeting about how pissed off he is about something yeah like that like he won the existential lottery and he's miserable and angry and bloated and how he's even still alive no we don't understand. Like, no one understands no one what understands. creepy grinch heart does he have but like <laughs> so but i'm saying like Everybody is on that track yeah. to some extent, and it's recognizing that that track doesn't work, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work for anyone. Like, there, everyone here is filled, we all are, filled with like a degree of resentment, a degree of anger, a degree of jealousy, like, oh, if I had that, or if I didn't have this, as I point to my crotch, <laughs> um, <laughs> if I had that, that like, um, comedy. Uh, <laughs> We all think like things would be so much better and they never, well, within reason. Like, yeah, if you're freezing to death, having a little warmth and being having a place to sleep, that will make you happier. If you're starving, mm -hmm. having some calories will make you happier. But for most of us, there's no cure for the human condition except accepting the human condition. Okay. Well, what I'm hearing from that is we should send your book to Donald Trump ASAP. But I'm um, just waiting. in the meantime. So, here, so actually the publisher when, because I included, if you don't know, there's yeah, a scene. Tell it. So there's a scene in the book where I was in a bar with some friends, my, our friends Lee and Dale, Paul, and um, who we grew up with. And they were telling me about this game they used to play at college called Knob Touch. And Knob Touch is simple. You take your flaccid, compromised penis out of your pants and you walk around, you just brush up against people, men and women, not sexual. <laughs> And they would say, like, the score was how many people they could brush up against in a crowded room. And so they challenged me, and I was very drunk at the time. They said, they said, so do it, do it, play knob touch. And the only person I have knob touched is Donald Trump. <laughs> and so the publisher of the book was actually, I'm not kidding, he wrote me an email, and I wish I had saved it. He said, you know, maybe you want to, like, in the era of Me Too, exclude this. Uh, and I was like, are you kidding? This For, is every... If, like, if yeah. Donald Trump Me Too's me? Dear God, like... <laughs> that would be the greatest thing, like... Well, I was saying, I mean, I think part of the reason, and, and when you were on Bill Maher's show, this came up, it's like, this is, you, we are all getting, I, I, I can only speak for myself, I guess, but there's a s serious vicarious thrill going on for, thank you mm. for, for uh, performing this act of, you know, humiliation for perhaps all involved, but mm -hmm. especially for him that we all now get to think about. And, and fingers crossed, in. fingers crossed he me too's me. Wouldn't that I be mean, great? That's like Stalin saying, like, you were mean to me. <laughs> well, we know how he, he likes to get distracted by uh, things that should destroy him. So yeah. maybe <laughs> you can be next. Maybe you can take that on for us. Um, um, oh, Q&A. Yeah, by the let's way, do it. Because we're going to do Q&A, and then we're going to play some songs. Um, I, I once did a Q&A with David Lynch, and there was this great moment 
um, where someone yelled out to David Lynch. They said, David, give me an idea. <laughs> and without batting, with, like without waiting a second, he just said, a bowling ball floating in space filled with red ants. <laughs> and they were I like, I guarantee Thanks. you, none of my questions and none of my answers are going to be as good as that. <laughs> That's a really good okay. story. Hey, Moby, I saw you uh, 2008 at EDC, and you played Thousand at the very end of your set. How many more sets did you end with that song? With Thousand? Yeah. Well, Thousand was a song I wrote in 1992. Um, it goes real fast. <laughs> and it became just this thing where, like, every show ended with it. And, I mean, probably, I mean, I've played thousands of shows where <laughs> I've ended with that. And one of, it's all got all these strobes going on, and it's, it's a really awkward thing to perform because I just stand there. So it's, at first I was like, wow, this is so weird. Like I'm just standing on top of a keyboard for four <laughs> minutes. And I would raise my hands in the air because I'd be like, I gotta do something. <laughs> and I'd stand there with my hands in the air. And it's like, now they're in the air. I can't bring them down because the song's still going. Okay. Um, but also, one of the good things is a lot of the strobes were behind me, so whenever someone would throw something at me, I could see them in the strobes. Like, <laughs> so like something would be coming towards me, I'd be like, I could swat it out of the way. Hi, Moby. How Hi. do we help more people who found the gift of recovery? How do we help them find the gift of veganism? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's almost healing in a way in very basic terms, if I had to describe recovery, it's sort of like it's the end of magical thinking and the willingness to accept that actions have consequences. You know, because for years, I would go out saying to myself, like, oh, maybe tonight I'll only have two drinks. It's like, you've never done that. You always have 15 <laughs> drinks, and you always do whatever <laughs> drugs are put in front of you. Like, t how is tonight? And like, maybe tonight's going to be different. No, it wasn't. Or saying, like, oh, maybe I'll have 15 drinks and I won't be hungover tomorrow. Like, avoiding the evidence is what we do as a species. But it's the same thing we do with animals. And I did it up until the time I was 19. So I've been a vegan now for about 31 years. So, but for years, like, when I was 18 years old, I was like, I love animals. Like, we have rescue animals and I love them unconditionally. But then I would go to Burger King. And it was almost like the brain prioritizes narratives mm -hmm. and actions that sort of trigger serotonin and dopamine, and it creates these self-serving narratives, even if they're very contradictory. You know, to say like, oh, loving animals makes me happy, and over here, eating animals makes me happy. And, and it's almost healing, like in a hemispheric way, mm -hmm. that neurochemistry, and saying like, oh, as much fun as it is to hold on to two utterly contradictory thoughts, we're better than that, you know, saying like awareness has to inform actions and the, like the awareness of consequences has to inform the way we approach action. Mm. Did I just ramble on like a grad student? I'm sorry. Yeah. But basically <laughs> make, say to people, oh, you love animals, then why are you contributing to their suffering and death? That's inconsistent. You know, if you love children, you don't lock them in cages and eat them unless you're a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Moby. I'm wondering if you could tell us your thoughts about living in New York when you did versus living in California now. Um, I mean, living in New York was great, and it still is great. Um, I saw a documentary recently about New York in the 80s, and it made me so nostalgic. And as I was watching it, I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm kind of nostalgic for the way New York was. I was actually just more nostalgic for who I was then. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I was young, my liver was pink. <laughs> Um, and I don't know, I mean, LA and New York are both wonderful progressive places filled with progressive creative people. Um, for now, <coughs> excuse me, I do think in terms of like quotidian life, like day-to-day -day existence, LA, the fact that we can go like hiking anywhere, any time of year, that really appeals to me, like having immediate access to nature I think there is something nice about living in a place where technically we're not at the top of the food chain. 
You know, I saw some comedian say something like, the biggest problem is humans are at the top of the food chain. I was like, not in Griffith Park. <laughs> like, actually, there are a bunch of things in Griffith Park that would happily, like, kill you and eat you. And there's something, one, like, I was hiking in the, the deep wilds of Griffith Park one afternoon, and there were all these coyotes, and I was like, oh, this could go wrong. <laughs> and I, I'm glad it didn't, but maybe a little disappointed at the same time. <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting eaten by coyotes. <laughs> Worst ways to go. Hey, Moby. Hi. So I've been your fan since a little girl, and I didn't even realize that it was you. So today we were scaring, and I'm like, who's that old guy? And, <laughs> and then I was like, wait, let's play some of his music. And then we played it in the car, and I was like, oh my god. I not only knew all the songs, but actually I loved them since a little child. And it's like, you were so amazing for your art. So I wanted to ask you about that, because I think that's who <laughs> you are. Your art is the, the most art? amazing thing. Yeah. So tell me about your production and your compressors. I want to hear them all. <laughs> but, so you want to know about compressors? Was that the question was about compressors? Uh, um, I mean, the LA-2A <laughs> is pretty solid. An 1176, nice and transparent. Oh. Um, the Distressor, <laughs> also a good compressor. DBX, I gotta say, some of the full rack mount DBXs for kick drums, also really good. I could just keep going on and on and on. Oh, God. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I answered that correctly. Hi, Moby. Um, I just wanted to ask you about what you were talking about right in the end. Uh, about how we set ourselves up for disappointment um, by setting these unachievable goals. And if we find the harmony in just like living, how do you find that balance? Because goals is what leads us to what we do every day. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it gives us like a, a purpose. And you said there is no purpose, and that's the human condition, but <laughs> like, where is the balance, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think it's hard to answer. I mean, everybody's in a different place in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of their life, in terms of their age, in terms of their ambitions. Um, and it, it's sort of like what the existentialists wrestled with. It's what philosophers have been wrestling with for a very long time. It's like, how do we know if our lives have meaning and significance? And it. Boy, it's a hard question to answer. Because um, I can only, I guess for myself, what I do is try to approach things with a sort of naive humility of like, I don't know if my actions have meaning and significance. I don't know if, what I, if I don't know if I'm making things better or worse, but wake up every day and just sort of hum, be, be humble and try to be of service and you try, you know? And you never know if what you're like, who knows, maybe we die and we go to like some cliched heaven and there's like some old guy with a white beard and he's like, you did not bomb abortion clinics, you're going to hell. Doubtful, but it's possible. Or there's just an empty void that has no meaning whatever, or who knows what. what I, it's also a tricky thing for me to talk about because it involves spirituality which, and God, which are like things that we don't tend to talk about in polite society. Um, so, but my, spiritual beliefs, my interest in God, whoever God might be, like it's not religious, it's not dogmatic or denominational, is the idea of complexity. You know, like my worldview is incredibly simple. You know, like I look at my body and like there are some hands, I don't see the complexity of like billions of cells working in concert with each other. I had some black beans earlier, I don't see the process by which they're turned into fingernails and optic nerves and white blood cells. So that complex complexity to me is evidence that there's so much more going on that I could ever conceive of. So all I wanna do is learn from it and be in service to that complexity. I use the word God because I don't know what else to call it, but I had dinner with Sam Harris and he got all mad at me for using the word God. So like, I don't know if I'm gonna use the word God anymore, but like, <laughs> it's, that idea, like looking at the limits of human activity as evidenced by the world in which we live and trying not to go down those paths and finding our own path in a way that is supported by evidence and seems sort of self-sustaining, if that makes any sense. Yeah. 
Time for uh, two more questions. <laughs> Hi, Bobby. I don't know where you are. Uh, right over here on the right, your left. So left. I saw you oh, okay. at uh, Coachella in 2013, and you got up on stage and you took pictures of us, and you were so full of life and energy. It was I, a ruse. <laughs> I saw a lot of live acts that day, and yours was the most memorable. My question to you is, how do you stay so energetic and so magical in your performances when it um, comes to live acts? In those cases, it, it, and I, want, I wish I had a more elaborate answer, it's just simply the love, like in, wow, I wanna have a smart answer, but it's the love for music and the love for that, that experience. Like there's something, like if I was in the audience, I'd be having the same reaction. And I, wow, I really wish I had a better answer, but it's just that, <laughs> it's just like love and enthusiasm. And, um, and actually, I do remember once, so keep going back to my friend Paul. Paul, you still here or did you leave? You still here, okay. So Paul went to SUNY Purchase, State University of New York at Purchase, and one time he was having a dance party in his dorm and we were playing, I don't know, some terrible like Neil Diamond record. <laughs> and he started dancing really enthusiastically and it was very genuine. And I noticed it sort of gave license to the people around him to also dance enthusiastically. Cause we all are very cautious, guarded people. So it's that way, that in a well, it's in a well, in a way is like standing up there, being enthusiastic, sort of saying to people like, I'm willing to p potentially humiliate myself in front of a big group of people, <laughs> which hopefully gives you license to maybe open up and be relaxed as well. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. And our final question for the evening. Hi, Moby, over here. Oh, hi. Big fan. Um, my question to you is, how do you feel about pet ownership as a vegan? Do, would you say that it's cruel to keep an animal in your house against its will, or would you say that it's rather kind to house an animal, feed it, care for it, love it? What's um, your opinion? As a fully indoctrinated vegan, I prefer the term companion animal, because it does put it sort of more on equal footing, but that's just me, because like to quote that guy in The Simpsons, like I'm a level five vegan. I don't eat anything that has a shadow. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to say, like, I mean, dogs especially, dogs and humans for hundreds of thousands of years have evolved to have this like incredibly symbiotic relationship. And a lot of dogs, when they're not cohabitating with humans, live very, sad compromised lives. Like if you've been to parts of the world where like the dogs are just like sick and uncared for and they're hungry. So in those instances, the symbiotic love, and with cats as well, the cats, obviously the symbiosis between cats and humans is not as long standing as with dogs. That's why cats are, I mean, cats are all things considered like the most remarkably paradoxical creature in the world because they're soft and they're cuddly, <laughs> but they're also genocidal monsters. <laughs> you know, I mean, just imagine, first of all, everything about them is designed to destroy. <laughs> like these teeth <laughs> and these claws, like they're just like, they're the, like the most effective killing machine that nature has ever produced. And like, for example, I saw a coyote kill, what was it? Like actually, uh, let's say a squirrel and it killed it in less than a second. Like grabbed it, shook its neck, broke its neck, done. Merciful, like if you're gonna go, like that squirrel died a good death. Cats, if you've ever watched a cat kill something, <laughs> oh, they take a tiny little defenseless mouse. So here you have like this cat, which is a hundred times the mass of this mouse. The mouse can't defend itself, so what does a cat do? Kills it for 90 minutes or longer. Like there, but then, they're soft and fluffy and cute, and I love them. So, <laughs> sorry for that tangent, but it's just so weird that like, um, and so I, it's hard with, with dogs and cats, and especially we do live in like the Anthropocene era, you know, this, this sadly, I think it's horrible, but like a, a world that is dominated by humans. And so the human relationship with a lot of animals can sometimes is necessary for the survival of those species, you know? And yeah, that's all I got.
Okay, so everyone's having a nice time? It's very quiet. Okay. Okay, so this is, I'll sing this song by myself, and then I'll have a big reveal as the rest of the musicians come out, the ones who are standing just a few feet away. Um, so this is the song from which the title of the book came. Thank you. Streamways are back again, stream places I didn't know. I broke everything new again, everything that I'd owned. Threw it out the windows, came along. Streamways I know will part the colors of my sea, all perfect coloring. Streamways that held me, that held me out late at night. Stream places I had gone. Never seen any light Dirty basements, dirty noise Dirty places coming through Stream worlds alone Did you ever like it then? Oh, I would stand in line for this There's always room in life for this Oh, babe Oh, babe then it fell apart, it fell apart. Oh, babe, oh, babe. Then it fell apart, it fell apart. Stream sounds, it told me, held me out late at night. Well, I didn't have much to say, I didn't give up the light. I close my eyes, I close myself, I close my world. I'll never open up to anything that could cut me at all. I had to close down everything. I had to close down my mind. Too many things would cut me. Too much could make me blind. I've seen so much in so many places. So many heartaches, so many faces, so many dirty things. You couldn't even believe how oh, I would stand in line for this. There's always room in life for this. Oh, babe, oh, babe, and it fell apart, it fell apart. Oh, babe, oh, babe. Then it fell apart, it fell apart. Would you say my name was? I'll say it then. Would you say my name was? I'll say it then. Well, I know I can't. Oh, I know I can't. Well, I know I can't find love, babe. Oh, babe, then it fell apart, it fell apart. Oh, babe, oh, babe, then it fell apart, it fell apart. Oh, babe, oh, babe, then it fell apart, it fell apart. Oh, babe, oh, babe, like it always does, always does. Um, also, and I don't want to get in trouble, you know, it's a little weird to play when people aren't videoing. I'm so accustomed to playing in front of people with phones where they're taking pictures. Like, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, what am I, it's like, it makes me think like I'm doing something wrong. I'm like, this is not worthy of Instagram. Um, so at the risk of pissing off the venue, if for some reason you feel like surreptitiously videoing or taking pictures, by all means, like far be it from us to stop like digital democr democracy, right? Um, but just do it surreptitiously, so whatever. Laura, Dawn, and Darren Murphy, and Julie Mintz are going to join us. Any 
Any other requests? Check, check. Check, keep. Are we? How about check? Whenever, okay, check, on, check. There, it's a leading question, because whenever I stand up here and ask for requests, what I want is for someone to yell out Freebird. <laughs> because my high school punk rock band, the Vatican Commandos, we learned Freebird on the off chance anyone would yell Freebird. And so I just assume if I say any requests, someone's gonna yell. Oh, really? Okay, great. <laughs> well, if I leave here tomorrow, would you still remember me? Cause Lord, I must be traveling on. Darren, you could play harmonica with this, couldn't you? That's in G major, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you, you do a slide. Ready? Yeah. One, two. song that I did a sort of cover of for the album play <coughs> and we've never played it so if halfway through it doesn't work out we'll stop playing it <laughs> Lord God Almighty have you heard the news my head got wet in midnight do great God I've been down Bended knees, talking to the Lord from Galilee. Michael spoke and it sounds so sweet. Thought I heard the shuffle of angels' feet. He put one hand upon my head. Great God Almighty, let me tell you what he said. I go tell that lonesome liar. Tell that midnight rider. Tell the gambling, rambling backslider. Tell them God Almighty gonna cut them down. I run on for a long time. Run on. Ducking and dodging, run on children for a long time. Let me tell you, God Almighty gonna cut you down. You might throw your rock, hide your hand, work in the dark with your fellow man. Show sure as God made you rich and poor, you gonna reap what you sow. You better run on for a long time. Run on, ducking and dodging, run on children for a long time. Let me tell you, God Almighty gonna cut you down. You Some people go to church just to signify Try to make a date with your neighbor's wife Brother, let me tell you, just to show as you're born You better leave that woman alone Go tell that lonesome liar Tell that midnight rider Tell the gambling, rambling backslider Tell them God Almighty gonna cut them down You might have run on for a long time Run on Ducking and dodging, run on children for a long time. Let me tell you, God Almighty gonna cut you down. You might have run on for a long time. Run on, ducking and dodging, run on children for a long time. Let me tell you, God Almighty gonna cut you down. You might. When we were playing that, it suddenly, like, it feels like it's like 1952. And this is like some old timey radio show, doesn't it? Back in 1952, I remember it so well. I was like young and idealistic, working on the Eisenhower campaign. Um, you don't want to do that. 
you, you don't, Julie, do you want to sing it? Okay. Is your vocal loud enough? Check, check, check. I can hear myself. So Julie and I, I wanted her to do a cover of Purple Rain. And then in the middle of it, she was like, oh, it also sounds like this other song. So it's sort of an acoustic mashup. All right, you sure? Okay. I feel bad now. No, okay, it's okay. okay. <laughs> Never meant to cause you any sorrow. I never meant to cause you any pain. I only wanted one time to see you laughing. I only Julie Mintz and Laura Dawn.
Um, do you guys want to do a sing-along? Yeah. Okay, great. So this is a June Carter Cash song, and we play it often when we're sitting in Lauren Darren's living room, or let's say my backyard with my trees that used to be a pool. And um, it has a trumpet solo in the middle. And are you familiar with the trumpet solo of this song? Some might be. You don't even know what song I'm talking about, so what, oh, I, uh, I'm an idiot. So, but what I'd like to do is for everyone here, if we all sing the trumpet solo together, you are, of course, as this is still at, until William Barr gets his way, this is still a free society. Um, so you can choose not to sing the trumpet solo, but just keep in mind that is like a public admission that you've given up on life and you've chosen like a sad and joyless existence, but that's your choice. Love is a burning thing And it makes a fiery ring Bound by wild desire I fell into a ring of fire I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down, down, down And the flames went higher And it burned Taste of love is sweet when hearts like ours be. I fell for you like a child. Oh, and the foul and wild. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher, and it burned. Burns, burns the ring of fire, the ring of fire. So you remember earlier, we were talking about doing a trumpet solo together. So that aforementioned trumpet solo, this is the time in the song when we would sing it together. And again, you don't have to, there's no pressure. But just keep in mind that like this might be the only life you have in this 15 billion year old universe. Um, as sort of like matter just keeps like pushing itself away from one another, and like dark matter overtakes everything. So again, you can choose, again, a compromised, sad, joyless, only existence with this background of like black matter and desolation and the void, or you can sing a trumpet solo. One, two, three, four. So we're going to do one more song because then I think I'm going to go out front and sign books. Um, if for some reason you are a crazy person who wants to like, kill me while I'm signing books, just do it quickly, okay? That's all I ask. Like just simple back of the head, boom, done. I wouldn't even know it's coming. Just saying. Um, so this next song was written by... It's a legitimate request um, by Willie Dixon, and then it was made popular by the contemporary rock and roll group Led Zeppelin, and yeah. And then there's one of my own songs that we're going to sort of like shoehorn in the middle of it, right? <laughs> and also, Laura and Darren are married and have a child, so they don't get much of an opportunity to express the libidinous aspect of their relationship. <laughs> so sometimes there's a caveat. Sometimes it can, the subtext can get a little dirty here. 
What's the opposite of subtext? Overt text? Over text. Yeah. <laughs> like, context. It gets a little steamy. I, can I get a little bit more thingamajig? Please don't kill Moby. You need cooling. Oh, baby, I'm not fooling. I'm going to send you back to school. Way, way down inside, honey, you need it. I'm going to give you my love. I'm going to give you my Sometimes I get a hope in my back. Sometimes I'm going over here. Sometimes, hey, my honey, come back. Sometimes I want to wrap that jack. Sometimes I get a hope in my back. Sometimes I'm going over here. Sometimes, way down yonder. Sometimes way down yonder, way down yonder, and I wanna come back sometimes. You were cool and baby, I've been drooling, and no. and Darren Murphy and Laura Dawn. And thank you, Lizzie, if you're still here. Thanks, Lizzie. <laughs>